I'm one of the curators here at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library Museum. Welcome to anyone uh, who, if this is your first time. Uh, we have two great new exhibits that just opened up in our museum, which is the longest walkway on the second floor. Uh, in the first gallery, we have Tales from La Vida, Latinx comics, the display of all contemporary um, and some historical um, uh, comics and cartoon art created by Latino and Latina uh, cartoonists. Uh, we also have an exhibit up right now called Tell Me a Story Where the Bad Girl Wins the Life and Art of Barbara Sherman. Barbara was one of the first uh, female New Yorker cartoonists. And just a little plug, we're going to be doing an event uh, related to that exhibit in, uh, the first week of February in 2019 uh, with Liza Donnelly, who's a current New Yorker cartoonist who wrote the book uh, Funny Ladies. And it's kind of like the historian of, of women working at the New Yorker. So um, if you haven't noticed already, we have this wonderful display of items pulled out here around the room. These are all from the Nicole Hollander collection, and they were selected by my colleague Ann Lennon. So Ann is going to be um, doing the interview tonight. Just to back up a little, the way this is going to work is once I'm done here, uh, I'm going to play a little video, then Nicole's going to come up and give a presentation, then Nicole and Ann will be in conversation for a little while, followed by the Q&A, and then the book signing. So lots of moving parts. Um, Nicole is, I mean, Ann is our um, archives associate here at the Billy Ireland, and I'm so glad that uh, she agreed to do this event and that we can highlight her in this way because she's one of the many people here whose work really happens entirely behind the scenes. And she's not, you know, usually in the spotlight like this, but the work she does is essential to what we do here, to making collections available um, and to keeping them preserved. She's worked on a number of large collections, uh, the biggest of which is probably the International Museum of Cultural Art Collection that had around 200,000 items in it. Uh, as well as the B.N. Duncan collection, and of course, the Nicole Hollander collection. And when Anne works with these, uh, with these pieces, she gets to have a really um, intimate knowledge of the artist and of all of the work that's, that's in the collection. So uh, she might not admit this herself, but she has, she's extremely well-versed well in this field, and especially uh, with the, the work of the artist that she's um, uh, archived. Of course, our special guest is Nicole Hollander, uh, creator of the very long-running uh, comic strip Sylvia, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, so Sylvia uh, ran for over 35 years in over 80 newspapers. Um, it commented on everything from uh, feminism to politics, uh, society, cats, a really big one. <laughs> um, and uh, Nicole also had a great career in um, graphic design before she became a comic strip artist, which we'll hear a little bit more about tonight, and was the art director um, for the feminist magazine, The Spokeswoman. Um, Nicole, this year, published a graphic memoir called We Ain't Wonder Bread, which we are going to have a book signing for um, immediately following this. So thank you all for being here. And I'm going to play this little video. Join me in welcoming our guests. Okay. <laughs> Me laughing behind her. 
everybody in the neighborhood watched out for them. That doesn't mean they were always nice to them. My father was a very um, loud uh, atheist, and, and he was he always wanted to upset the neighborhood. And my mother was so much fun. I was the only child in the neighborhood who knew what a capon was. This book might be for people who have nostalgia about a certain kind of neighborhood that just can't possibly exist anymore. Join me in welcoming Nicole. <laughs> I think that I had the most fun career that anybody ever had. I, one of the wonderful things I was thinking about, we ate Wonder Bread, is that I spent weeks thinking about it should be, we all ate Wonder Bread. Some of us ate Wonder Bread. We, we made spitballs out of Wonder Bread. <laughs> So um, I did it for a long time, uh, 35 years, and then it finally seemed to me that um, my editors were interfering in my life too much. They, they would say things like, too much writing, more drawing, less writing. And, and so I thought, well, I have to get out of this business. I don't know, you know, I, I think that when this happens, I think you, you don't even think about what in the world will I do? Will somebody just come up and give me money? <laughs> well, they forgot to do that. So, <laughs> so I wanted to give you some um, image of what my very long career looked like. Oh, good. Um, this is a drawing. The first drawing uh, is a drawing that I did at Boston University. And I was, I, I was going to be a serious artist. And um, I mean, she actually looks like a person. You know, her arms look like they could work. Um, and and I, I got real tired of that. So uh, I started doing Sylvia. And Sylvia. She didn't stand up very much. Um, <laughs> she watched a lot of television. She talked back to people. Um, her life was ma made up of just conversation with lots of people. And she had a tremendous amount of friends. And um, my mother had great friends. So this was a thing that I grew up with, that you had to have really good girlfriends. She knew these women. Um, they were young teenagers when they met, and they would go door to door and sell magazine subscriptions. Um, they went out with the guys who belonged to the same social club. They married those guys. They all had girls. I don't know. If you didn't have a girl, maybe you had to go away. <laughs> I'm skipping that one because I don't like it. So, uh, my father was very political, um, and and he thought very much about how people's lives really were determined by where they lived, how much money they had, what kind of job they had, and um, so I was early on thinking about unions. I had to do an assignment for a a class. Um, it's from the Goodman Theater. And the assignment was uh, music, music that changed you, or the first concert that you saw. And so I, I remembered that there was a song called, I Thought I Saw Joe Hill Last Night, as live as you or me. 
I did not die, said he. So I'll start crying right now. Uh, and then Eartha Kitt in 19, faces of 19, maybe 62. Uh, Eartha Kitt was, was an icon. Ronald Reagan wanted her to come to the White House. She said, I wouldn't dream of going to any place where you were a president. Um, I think that if Trump has not made that illegal, it will be made illegal. You will not be able to turn down an invitation. I just want to show how much fun I had all the time because I just, we were always trying to raise money. And, and so we had, uh, we had auctions. So here I have a, a woman pulling um, a set of very large dentures. And you could, in fact, bid on uh, having your name in lights at the Biograph Theater. Then I had a job for an insurance company. This is so old fashioned and wonderful. These were independent insurance men. And in order to get them to come and use our insurance, they would send them a little metal calendar. If you look at that, we made a die cut every month in something so that they could take that calendar and put it on their watch and, and bend it into place. Why anyone wouldn't be ashamed to be wearing something like that, I, I have no idea. But it was popular. <laughs> Then I uh, had a job doing posters, goody goody poster. The price of your hat ain't the measure of your brain. Oh no, this is my this is my favorite. Uh, fatal choices. Do you remember Fatal Attraction? She cooked his bunny, and I was rooting for her. This, this is like. This idea of, I want to see the bad girl win. Yeah. This is Freud. You will sleep now, and when you awaken, you will imagine that you have achieved full equality, and it has made you deeply unhappy. I grew up around... Um, small time delis. My, my dad uh, had dreams of opening up a deli that would be successful. And they look, they look like this all the time. And he also, he lost his partners usually the first day he opened the store because he was so difficult to get along with. Oh, and this, this is the waitress that just tells you just what you have to do and what she's going to offer you. Yeah. Ruby, not everyone likes the HMO humor. Is there HMO anymore? I don't know. Ah, wait, come back. This is my mother's very good friend. She had three very good friends, and this is Esther. And in fact, she is. In a way, Sylvia, because she was had she was all legs, uh, very buxom, very long legged, and very you can look at her eyes and just know that she could make you deeply uncomfortable if she wanted to. <laughs> Behind her, I'm sitting and beaming. I'm just so happy to be in her presence. That was an early one. We're going to skip that one. Um, Rita, you must leave us. Alien beings are among us. And she says, yes, in public office. <laughs> then I used to have um, look-alike contests. And, and women would just uh, forget about any kind of, you know, trying to, to look good in any way. They would look like Sylvia and have a chance to have cigarettes just hanging out of their mouths mm -hmm. and a chance to wear a bathrobe in public. 
Then a woman wrote me, and she said, uh, I've been making these Sylvia dolls. I've been sewing them by hand. And she said, I'm going to start to sell them now. Um, so I thought I'd tell you. <laughs> and it's, it's not that we ever made any money, but I said, well, could you come to Chicago? And so she came to Chicago, and we spent the entire weekend talking about the height of the heels that Sylvia would wear. <laughs> Oh, I got, I got letters. I have some very, I think I have to move closer. I have some very unusual reasons to be interested in your column on July 23rd, 1982, which was about the concerned Venusian for the planet Earth. I would appreciate it greatly if you would explain to me why you thought of all of those details and, and chose the Venusians in particular as a space alien you would like to know. My reasons for being interested, I will write you back and explain, but it may be quite lengthy. <laughs> I, was, I was terrified. <laughs> Why is the Sylvia strip gone? Why did you take Sylvia out of your comic section? Are you demented or what? <laughs> My mother and father at the Shaperie in Chicago. My father had a wonderful vocabulary. My mother had a wonderful wit. He said, I bet you don't know what a male swan is called. And she said, a swine. <laughs> and this, I'm sure I'm wrong about this. I want, I wanted to show that Reagan didn't know it. Thank you. Thank you for laughing. Thank you. No idea if that looks like Ohio. <laughs> Clarence Pendleton, head of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, revealed today that he hadn't realized that he was black. But now that it had been brought to his attention, things would change at the commission. <laughs> yes, women wear slacks and no one comments on it. And he asked her, in, well, this is why this woman thought I knew Venusian. Um, <laughs> what would happen if you wore a dress? Well, some people would invite you to parties and some people would attempt to beat you to death. See, this is, this is like, I got away with this and I don't know why. Uh, I think because I didn't believe that I, I couldn't actually see people reading my cartoon. So how did I know they really were reading it? And if they wrote me a letter, they had to send it to the newspaper. So it took a while for me to get anybody's letter. And by that time, I felt they, they weren't going to find me anyway. <laughs> oh, this is my favorite one. Alabama's ban against vibrators stands. State says there's no constitutional right to an orgasm. Rita, get me my copy of the Bill of Rights. I think it's in the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I, uh, I think I had to uh, apologize for this one. Um, culture alone doesn't make us who we are. The brain is differently wired in men and women, so I said, in men, the wires are loose, and I got a lot of mail. <laughs> <laughs> the Supreme Court staggered the nation today when they ruled that conception begins the minute you think about sex. <laughs> <laughs> There's another one I'm not going to go through a lot with, except that Mobile Oil called me because I made a joke about them. And I'm talking to them, and I'm sweating because I think they're gonna they're gonna sue me. They're a big company. And finally, the light dawned. I said, um, "What's your job over there in Mobile Oil?" He said, "Oh, I'm." He, he was in in promotion or something, you know. So he had absolutely no power at all. And I just had I relaxed. This was very bad, a bad mistake. The Senate 
passed a bill today that would outlaw abortion unless the doctor's life is in danger. I was in front of hundreds of people who worked in the health industry. I think I never looked at this cartoon until I heard the intake of breath among people who already had seen that their friends were being shot. Cats who gloat. Fluffy and I will not be paying for the SNL bailout. We didn't vote for Reagan either. <laughs> This was an ad on television. Mom, can a douche make you feel more confident? And Sylvia says, not like a good stock portfolio. <laughs> so this woman signs herself an RN and a mother. The man who is editor of this uh, newspaper, it was in Washington, DC. And he ran the thing on the front page and I called him up and I said, were you just wondering if one person hadn't seen it and you thought you'd make sure that everybody saw what I said to this mother, RN and mother? And he said, that is my job. And there are very few people who think that is their job now. Okay. Um, I will try to be more understanding of others. I will try to be more patient when dealing with the incompetent people that surround me. I will not slap anyone first thing in the morning. <laughs> Today, as part of the government's Healthy Forest Initiative, President Bush flew over many of the nation's forests, and Phil says, causing them to disappear. Ma, saying something like that is going to be illegal any minute. <laughs> Hi, Mom. You and your bridge club are volunteering to search for weapons of mass destruction? I am so proud of you, Mom. Are you going to Iraq? No. Iran? Korea? No. Paris? Well, I agree, it's more fun to look for WMDSs there, bringing back some shoes. <laughs> I dreamt that everyone I knew cashed out their stocks before the market crash. I called my sister, I said, why didn't you tell me? Didn't you get the memo, she asked, coolly? No, I shouted, well, it's probably on your dresser under a pile of dirty laundry. Well, it was. <laughs> Resolutions of cats. In 1989, I resolved to develop a longer attention. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, everybody. Okay. I went to see a one woman show at the Goodman Theater last week. And this woman is standing on, on stage for like two hours and she's doing a whole wonderful one woman show. And and you know, and she's running up and down the stairs, she's about my age. And and the last run up, she trips. And I think I should not have been allowed to see this because now I, I just think about that. All the, I'm going to sit down. No, you do. <laughs> because I'm so nervous. <laughs> oh, like no. Caitlin said, I'm usually behind the scenes and uh, it's a real honor for me to sit up here with you because um, you know, I had the I had the pleasure of actually opening the boxes and describing what was what is in the collection. And um, yeah, we had a lot of fun pulling out things to share with everybody today. And I hope that you all get a chance to spend some time looking at the materials. Um, yeah, we're really grateful that you donated the collection to the Billy Ireland. Can people actually come in? 
They can, yeah. We That's have really a list. Incredible. That's what we do is we list everything. So and and we put it online, and anyone anywhere in the world can come or can can check the list, come and uh, see materials here. We've digitized various items, and they're in our digital collection. So yeah, it's easy it's easy wonderful. to find your material now. Um, but I want to ask you, and this is a strange first question, but um, I want to ask you about table lamps. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I was really drawn to um, your details and um, even your waistcoat tonight. You know, how, how much you enjoy drawing details and decorations. Maybe you could tell us about how that came about or how you got where those where the inspiration came from. Everybody had great lamps, so um, it, it wasn't hard hard to find them. I mean, they they didn't last though, and I I my aunt and and they weren't they weren't politically correct. <laughs> they were all slave girls, you know. They were, you know they had these bodices that went down to their waist, and they, they but they were shiny, enamel, beautiful, and I decided that my aunt must still have one. I called her. I was about 80 years old and I called her and said, so what lamp do you have in the living room? You know, and, and she didn't. And she was so sad that she yeah. didn't have that lamp. Well, one of your sections is called Aunt Belle's Lamp. Aunt Belle's it? Lamps. Belle's Lamp. Yeah. Uh, something else you mentioned in We Ate Wonder about Bread was about listening to the radio um, and about listening to Jack Benny and about his timing. So I just wondered, maybe could you talk to us a little about timing in Sylvia and how how Jack Benny um, and listening to how uh, he, the surprise at the end, I think is how you said, I have a quote on the I'll be able to find it. Um, you know, you say, um, Jack Benny was my favorite. I learned timing from him. I adapted it to my cartoon strip. The long pause and then the surprise. And, so. and that, that's really it. And the wonderful thing is to find out that you can do that in writing, that you can do it by, by timing, by leaving white space, by um, making something drawn out, making something shorter. My family and I listened to Jack Benny. I don't know how often he was on, but I really did love him. And uh, then he was on television, and then you could see him. You know, he's standing up there, and he's, you know, he's got his arm crossed. He's got all the time in the world <laughs> to set up this joke. And uh, I, I do love to write. I, I think that for me, because I'm not a writer, writing is, is easier. I don't worry as much about it. So I can think about timing and how long you can pause and how, how to think about something. Whereas drawing, you actually have to do it. And if it doesn't work, you have to erase it or white it out. White out is the greatest invention <laughs> of our lifetime. Yeah. Because um, I, I was telling people that on a, on a cartoon, or at least when I did them, the only thing that the camera picked up was black. And so if you had whited something out very carefully, um, it looked like you were really a neat person. <laughs> so I was very happy with that. Um, in uh, We Ate Wonder Bread, you use crayon a lot. And it's a much freer type of style that you're using. It sort of seems almost animation-like. I just wondered how was it drawing that compared with the constraints of the panel in Sylvia? I got a um, I was able to go to a foundation um, in a very fancy suburb. I had a beautiful building to work in it, enormous walls and I could put uh, long paper all over the walls uh, and just um, staple it up and then just draw it with charcoal and I, I, I could just keep going. Um, so so that, that was a very different kind of, of drawing. 
Tom, do you want to tell how they wanted to kill us when they had to? Oh. <laughs> when well, they had to actually translate well, this into, into the book. Was that easy. Yeah. Because <laughs> they were on enormous rolls, about three feet tall by twelve feet long. Oh and wow! Actually, I worked from photographs of the scrolls, but at the end they decided that stenographics, for whatever reason, that these images were inadequate. So the call had to send these gigantic rolls of paper to the mail. And I don't think they ever used them. Besides, <laughs> the, 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 the they just let there, us get away with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose. Um, sorry, I'm blanking. <laughs> um, um, just talk. Just talk. <laughs> um, no, about the, the style. When we were in the archives, that's what I wanted to ask yeah. you, with Caitlin. When we were going around, um, you were telling me about how you drew Sylvia's, you just drew her once, and that it was a collage technique, work, which is also what we see in We Ate Wonder Bread. Um, it was so interesting to hear you both talk about Sylvia's head and how you created yeah, right. the created the the strip. So um, maybe could you explain about um, how you used that, how you did that, and the collage well, I, technique? I drew her. Um, I drew her sitting, and so that meant she was in profile, uh, and then I just kept copying her <laughs> and just you know changing the outfit. And um, I don't know um, if if I once said that she stood up or I just made it up, but she. I, I think I had her. I wanted people to see that she was really a big woman. Yeah, yeah. she was like my mother's friend Esther. You know, tall, yeah. long-legged, big bust, empowered woman. Um, Alison Bechdel says in the intro that um, it's a superhero origin story. It's Sylvia being the superhero, and um, yeah, so it's. It's so nice to see the strong women that dominated your childhood, or they, you know, were such a, an aspect of it. Were there there were three Olga, Esther, yes. and your mother was my Shirley. Mother. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you describe what what they looked like and what how did, how did they behave when they were together, and how did that feed into Sylvia then, who she is? Well, I they they didn't have babysitters, so they they took us with them. Um, and so we would go to restaurants, to delis, um, and we would be very quiet because if they knew we were there, that would just change the whole conversation. <laughs> um, and Esther was the, was the real bad girl of the group. I mean, she would actually go to New York with a friend of hers and they would have wild weekends, which, which we could only imagine how, <laughs> how wild and wonderful they were. Um, Alka, who was the last, the last one to remain alive, knew what everybody liked to eat. And I really miss her so much because you could come to her house at any time and she in the refrigerator she would have, I don't know if anyone knows what kasha is, but she would kasha. And, and, um, and noodles and, and soup. And she knew it was the thing that she liked. So I loved her. Did Sylvia cook? She Oh Sylvia she, didn't. No. No. <laughs> no. She didn't she didn't cook and, and uh, she spent a lot of time in the bathtub. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Her daughter would be begging her, please mom, did I just run in there and use the shower? No. Sorry. I'm busy. Um so uh, I just wondered if you came, you know, it's, Sylvia's quite a feminist strip, if you came to comics and feminism at the same time, because you came through this, your work with the spokesman, spokeswoman. <laughs> um, so I just wondered if the two kind of coincided. Now, I, I think that as soon as I heard of feminism, I was there. You know, yeah. I, wa I wanted that to be part of my life, um, and I wanted to march. I didn't want to be in danger in any way. I've never liked any kind of danger, but um, I would go to, to banks and protest, you know, and argue with men about how it wasn't doing us any favor not to give us credit. <laughs> yeah. um, 
And it was a, a, a very long argument, and I'm, I'm pretty amazed that we even, that we made it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, I look at them now, and I'm, you know, it's still the same argument. I wondered even, you know, you 30 years you've been preaching the same message. How did you feel when Me Too happened and in the, over the last couple of years? I, I, I kind of felt depressed because that involved work and sex. And these were women who had their living and their careers taken away from them uh, because of sex and because of power. And I, I just felt depressed. Again. But I don't, I don't stay depressed. No. no. Um, you know, when you drew Sylvia, had you a target audience in mind? Were you drawing for other women, you know, or was it, did you even think about it? I think I was drawing for my mother's palace. Okay. Yeah. They were always um, they were always around, and they always had wonderful stories. So I appreciated them very, very, very much. And Sylvia showed up on the funny pages. Can you tell us about some of the other women who were who were on the pages alongside Sylvia? What were they like? <laughs> well, you know, I've never been tried to be nice to Kathy, so I'm not going to start now. <laughs> I think Broom Hilda was a good one. <laughs> when did Superwoman come in? Had you read Brenda Starr or, you know, what, what other strip, what strips well, would you? Brenda Starr, I didn't really, you know, it just didn't seem like she, you know, she had all that hair. <laughs> and, um, and she must have spent a lot of time on it. And then she had the man that, did he have one eye or, you know, and he had um, orchids and um, <laughs> <laughs> see how I know the details of <laughs> nothing. Um, but it took a lot for Dale Messick to do this. Yeah, uh, She had to work very hard, uh, and she had to change her name so that she would sound yeah. like a man. Did I read that a woman cartoonist was an oxymoron? Were you told that, or was that something I dreamt up? No, <laughs> no, I'm sure somebody told me that. Yeah. Yeah. It's an oxymoron. Yeah. People didn't, I, I think that, Men who were in positions of, of power often didn't think, I don't know, that you were listening to them, or they would just talk. On the other hand, I have to say that since men were in positions of power, if there were not men who liked my work, I would have not gotten anywhere. Yeah. And they just went to bat for me. So um, I feel divided on the subject of men. Yeah. <laughs> Matt, what is it? Ma, can you be a feminist and That's still something. like men? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I just, I wondered, um, I think being a comic strip artist is probably a pretty lonely occupation. Um, did you find it that way? Or, or how, how was the relationship with your readership? Was that important to you that every day you knew they were reading you? Every day I, I had to write something and I loved I loved to I love to read the newspaper in a certain way. So you're reading in order to find out what can I pull out of here and make a cartoon out of. Because if you if you can't think of that, um, then nothing's going to happen. Oh I did want to tell about cousin Bob. Tom uh, had a, a cousin much older in his eighties when he approached. So Bob decided that he he could send me ideas. He's in his 80s. He's going to send me. I, I mean, I thought this was such chutzpah. You have to mention that he lived in a cabin in the Sierra. Yeah, he lived in a lonely kind of place. <laughs> Not so lonely, but you know, but he had access to the internet. So yeah, right. So it was fine. For Nicole and, and, and he read newspapers that I didn't read. 
Christian side martyr, and he found wonderful stories about weird Brits. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he would send them to me. And I used many of them. Many of them were really wonderful. And he, being a member of that family, um, made um, charts. So uh, he, he would put down what he had sent me and whether I used it in a cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about, you came to being a cartoonist relatively late, so you were 40. And I just wondered if that considerable life experience that you'd had, if that, um, you know, how did that play into the strong woman that Sylvia is? You know, do you think you were better off for starting at that stage in your life or it's not something you think about or just happen that way? I think it, ha you know, and, and I actually can't tell you how it happened that way. I, I think, again, that I started drawing and I brought it to some people and, and those people were looking maybe for something new. And so they gave they gave me a chance. But it's, it's pretty uh, murky in my mind. It's some, one day I became a cartoonist. And it was very nice. Yeah. <laughs> and you, I mean, you're unusual as a cartoonist in that you self syndicated, which was a ton of work on top of drawing every single day on Sundays. You were also dealing with all the correspondence with the newspapers. Um, how, how was that period in your life, and why did you decide to self syndicate? I think uh, I, I was very leery of, of people who would handle my work um, and decide whether how they would sell it. And um, I wanted them to be to be proud of it, to like it and to not be apologetic about it. And, and that was really, really important to me. Um, and I and I did have some of these wonderful features editors who went to bat for me. So I really very much didn't trust people who were going to, there would always be people who would come around and say, I, I know how to sell this work. I, I know, you're going to be so wealthy, you're going to be so happy you ran it, and it never was. <laughs> yeah. were you, was it 10 years? How long were, were you self-syndicating for through the 90s? Well, I must, then I must have. Um, decided that it, even though I didn't trust any of these people, that it was just simpler and cleaner for them to handle this work and to, and to sell it. So they did. I met some good people. Um, when we went through the archives, it occurred to me, I wondered um, who your influences were. You know, what other, who, who else do you like? Who do you read? What cartoonist work do you admire? Doesn't that sound terrible? Like I'm sitting here thinking, oh, there's no one. No, no. <laughs> it's the sort of question that maybe it's it's hard to think about it's, off it's the really, bat. It, it, I, I was thinking of uh, Alison Bechtel, and um, she used to do a strip called Dykes to Watch Out For. And I absolutely adored that because they, first of all, she drew, here I am drawing a woman sitting in a chair. And she's drawing all these different female bodies. And, and they have a bookstore, and, and, and they have an active friendship, and, and everyone goes to parties, and they know each other. Um, so I, I, I admired. She did. And then the other person I admired was the French, um, Clara Brecht. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and she's in the most important magazine or newspaper in the uh, in France. France. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can find. Was one of you influenced by Pfeiffer? I think so. Yeah. I'll say so. <laughs> <laughs> I was influenced by Pfeiffer. <laughs> and he wrote a wonderful introduction to one okay. of my books. Um, I wanted you because um, body image and the female um, body um, is you know, such a feature in your work. I just wanted you to describe for us what an ideal 1980s woman looked like. <laughs> Incredibly tall. Yeah. Yes. 
that that's what I've always wanted to be is is, is tall. Yeah. Um, and of course, she would have many different colors in her hair, um, and she would be able to wear hats mm -hmm. with great comfort and incredibly high-heeled shoes. She would never totter. <laughs> And she would have the money to buy those shoes. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, it seems, though, from We Ate Wonder Bread that you had, um, you know, in your childhood, you had a positive body image about yourself. And you talk about coming home on the bus in your bathing suit. So, yeah. <laughs> my, my father didn't think that was such a positive thing to do. Um, I, didn't, I, I wasn't wearing shorts. I was just wearing a bathing suit. But you didn't have any negative. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Yeah, wrong. yeah. It just, it just, Maybe it's just a little piece of information that I didn't have. <laughs> we we uh, talking. About, we have the robe here from um, the adaptation, the stage adaptation of Sylvia of the strip, and it's uh, really beautiful. And I feel like performance was a. It comes across in We Age Wonder Bread that when you were a child, you put on plays, and performance was important to you. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, is it? I don't know if I had any audience. I, I think that I, I remember going across the street. There was um, a house, and I could walk down into a little area, and I put on plays. I don't know if anybody was there, but it was satisfying all the same. And was it important to you that Sylvia did that? You did do that adaptation. Yeah, I love that, and I and I and I love to see that there was someone in this world that could really sing and carry a tune because I certainly not able to do that. So I loved having a musical. It was a dream come true. Good. Dancing, singing, all that. And on the next table, I have to ask you about cats. I mean, it's uh, impossible not to. Um, and they seem to, your cats seem to display the worst of our human traits. Is that fair, do you think? That they display the worst? Of our yes. traits. Yes. They're always hungry, I know that. They're yeah. always hungry and, and they say, say things like, we did not mean to kill the goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> they seemed a little sluggish. <laughs> or caffeine into their water. Um, yeah. Um, What's wonderful about them is that you know they you really can you can make them look like anything. You can make them appear to be saying anything, and they don't. <laughs> Um, so I, I suppose just to make sure everybody knows, you graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and then from Boston University, uh, University yeah. and you got an MFA in painting. Um, were it you really helped. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You maybe a, you can tell. A master's degree just really helped. Yeah. Um, so were you drawing from a young child or, you know? I know you talk in We Ate Wonder Bread about meeting the book illustrator and how you realized that was a job. Yes, and you, it was yeah. an actual job, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you, you knew early on that you were going to have to do it. And, yeah. Uh, and people, I think the people um, that I knew, that my parents knew, really didn't take any of that seriously. So, in fact, they were very permissive. You know, you want to be an artist? We will buy you every kind of pen that they have in the store because this is not going to happen. I think people didn't believe that it could happen. And, and so there's a, a wonderful thing about that. If, if no one's watching you, that, that, that you can become something without being guided. Yeah, it is a good thing. Um, and I just, you know, I just wanted to ask you maybe about your parents and they, you know, you say, I think your mother was really supportive of your art. But when you look at them, you know, with, um, you know, our understanding of our parents changes as we age. Um, did you feel more sympathetic towards them as you drew them and thought about them doing the memoir? How did you feel about them? Did it change, you know, had it over the, the the period of time from when you were a child, how when you I, went I looking that back. I felt more compassion for my father. Uh, my mother was um, witty and attractive, and he was a more difficult man, so he needed a bit more compassion. 
in the dedication, you say that your pol- well, it, you, he, you know, the fact that he took you when he joined the Carpenters Union, yes, right. he took you. So your whole politics, your yes, I mean, it, w- it seemed perfectly normal to him that he would take me with him and leave me in the car. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but really, he always he always treated me as someone that he could talk to, and and, and I appreciate it. Well, I don't want to hug you for the whole night. I'm sure people have questions. So um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Lovely to meet you. You too. And I wondered if anybody had a question or wanted to bring something up. Oh, yeah. Hi, Ian. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, I'm just for clumped. <laughs> The clumps. Yes, yes, yes. I watch Seinfeld too. <laughs> um, I wanted to thank you because uh, I discovered you when I was in college, and I just turned sixty this year, and it's been a wonderful experience to have seen another, seen a feminist. You know, it was like it really brought it home. But mostly, I miss what Molly Ivins might have, what her take might have been on the current resident of the White House, and I'm dying to know what Sylvia would have had to say. You have any thoughts on that? Really, it makes me so angry. It's just not, it's just <laughs> not a good place to go to. But Molly Ivins would have, you know, she, she had a column. She would have yeah. restrained herself to, to some extent, you know, and we need her. Yeah, and, we, need you know. her. we need her. And the other person we, we need, um, she was, uh, was she the governor in Texas? Oh, uh, Ann Richards. Richards. Yeah. 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 She would have well, been you. great. Thanks very much. I, you know, I'm worried. Yeah. I wish us luck. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Nicole. Um, I was just wondering, did your, uh, did your mom's friends get to see your work? And how did they respond to it? Um, I think I, w- I was the artist, you know, because kids could really only be one thing, you know. So if you were the one who drew the turkey in the for Thanksgiving in school, that's what you were. Did they ever see Sylvia? Um, Esther thought that she was like Sylvia. And so that that was um, supported by the other women in, in the group. Mm-hmm. So she got <laughs> and I just want to say one thing that her body was you're just so perfect for so I mean because she really in she was pretty tall compared to the other women in her group and had long legs and was very busty and and so she was Sylvia you know for sure yes. Um, I- I wanted to ask when I was when I, when it first started being syndicated. I remember just being so excited because it didn't look like the other things in the paper. It had a unique look. It had the look of of an actual personality behind it, and it, it wasn't a, it wasn't the most exciting time for syndicated comic strips in the in the early '80s. So this was really exciting for me. But I also even at the time I remember wondering. How did this happen? Like, did you get, did you, did you have pushback because your style was so idiosyncratic and unique, or was it kind of embraced by editors early on? I here we come to the part where I I I didn't know that I didn't know that people were reading it really. You know, I mean, I and so you know, you just go along then, and there are editors. Who are paying you by the month, and you say, "Oh yeah, I'm I'm in the newspaper," and um, and people write you letters. Some of them are so scary that, um, <laughs> but then there are wonderful people who 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 act like this is the you know the greatest thing since sliced bread. Where did you come from? You know, thank you. You know, thank you for thinking about the Venusians. Because no one talks to me about Venusians anymore. 
I also want you to know that my mother is utterly convinced that Sylvia was based on her. So <laughs> I'll have to break the bad news to her. <laughs> no, don't tell her. I, I dream of your mother. Any <laughs> other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. So, we Wonder Bread is um, for sale right outside the room. Nicole's going to be signing books. And also, please uh, stay and take a look at some of the items we have pulled out here. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.